All right, welcome everybody. A surf is excited to have you for today's webinar. Um, it's going to be presented by a few folks. A surf old sponsor company, Woodard and Crane. For those of you that don't know, Surf is the sustainable forum, a nonprofit organization to advancing sustainable practices. It has members from um, you know, folks from regulatory agents, academia, consultants, specialty vendors, among others. Um, so in order to find out more about SURF, feel free to visit our site. There's a ton of information there. White papers, case studies, including a case study from this presentation, um, links to previous webinars, and much more. So while you're free to sign up for our newsletter. You'll get a uh, surf break newsletter each month that kind of describes what surf is doing, some links to some interesting sustainability related articles and, uh, and where to find us. And then also while you're on the website, click on the uh, uh, social media links and give us a follow um, on our LinkedIn's and Twitter's and all that stuff. So. Uh, today, we have a great presentation for you, these folks on their sustainability efforts in mediating a former waste oil recycling facility, including water restoration and conservation, wild habitat restoration, and stakeholder engagement. So, we have a couple speakers. Um, our speaker is, among many other things, a recent former board member of SURF and um, a subgroup leader on the RC. Sustainable Resilient Remediation publication. If you haven't checked that out, highly recommend you check that out. We have Carrie, who's an environmental engineer focused on incorporating conservation, habitat enhancement, and sustainability into remediation projects, you know, primarily related to uh, requirements under CERCLA and RICRA corrective actions. And then finally, Katie in here. An active SURF member, she has uh, recently completed a technical initiative for SURF focused on C SiteWise tools. You can see her work on the SURF YouTube channel, so feel free to check that out and download some or watch some helpful user videos for those tools. So last audience members, you can find uh, a case study attached in the section of the platform. You can download that, read it later. It's a good read. You will be muted throughout the presentation. Please ask questions anytime using the chat function and we'll have a little Q&A at the end. So with that, here's our speakers. So it's all yours, Kathy. Great, thanks, Kyle. Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, we're really excited to share the work we've been doing on this pro particular project. Uh, I've been a part of this project team since Woodard and Curran uh, became involved many years ago. Um, it's and it's a real treat to be able to share the work that we're doing. Um, this this project team, um, I'm just we're just really fortunate um, to have everybody who's really seeking to not only clean up the environment in the most efficient manner um, and using greener approaches, um, but also value our overall impact to the the surrounding community. So uh, we'll we'll give a little bit of a highlight of the. Um, the remedy that's going on on site real brief with that but just how our sustainability story has progressed throughout the project uh, share just some brief efforts we've made and uh, wrap up with how we are tracking that that those efforts so just a starting off with the the site background here's the the site it's in um, new hampshire it's two parcels of land that are 48 approximately 40 acres combined you can see those here are highlighted in yellow uh, the property is bound by a brook uh, to the north and then the eastern side of the property line uh, you'll notice there are there's actually all private residences surrounding this um, this site there's no public water or drinking wa public water or sewer in the area and so uh, each of these homes has their own private septic system and drinking water well which comes into play with the, with the site. Um, so how did it become a super fun site? Here's an old aerial photograph. Uh, it was a former waste oil recycling facility uh, starting back in the, the mid 1920s uh, through the 1990s timeframe. 
thousands of New England residents and businesses had actually uh, paid to have their oil recycled at the facility. Um, it's permit was a permitted facility, um, but unfortunately, due to poor waste handling by the former operator, uh, it led to soil, groundwater, and sediment impacts. Uh, you'll see here uh, on this photograph, there's a lot, a large number of above ground storage tanks. Um, there also was a 140,000 gallon um, underground storage tank that leaked, uh, and in a lagoon, essentially an open pit where oil was uh, direct discharged to the to the ground. Uh, so really these impacts, um, we've got surface impacts, uh, surface soil impacts, uh, as well as what really um, kind of drove this from a Superfund standpoint is the uh, VOCs leaching out of the, the oil that was in the groundwater. Uh, and you've got those private drinking water wells pulling continuously uh, and help spread that those groundwater impacts to the private drinking water wells. Uh, the site was listed on the national priorities list in 1996, and in 2004, the EPA uh, uh, issued the ROD, the Record of Decision, uh, with the selected remedy for the site. And so we've been implementing that. Uh, the the client team is is about a dozen of those thousands that uh, had paid to to ship their waste to the site, and they're cleaning the site up in accordance with the ROD. So just for context, some of these uh, like this. This view of a, of a truck here next to the tank so you can see kind of the size of it. So one of the things, as I'm messing my slides up, so one of the things uh, we did early on is working with our, our regulatory team and we actually ended up shifting the sequence of the, the, the remedy that was outlined in the rod and it, it really had a lot of great benefits um, sustainability wise uh, down the road. Initially this is the layout of it, there was a site-wide soil excavation, I mentioned leaks and and spills, uh, and that's primarily driven shallow soils, anywhere two to 10 feet, uh, impacted with PCBs and lead. Uh, landfill excavation, it's not your, your typical municipal landfill. It really was just a, a lot of just debris and waste pushed over the side of the, the hill uh, and, and buried. Uh, we're finding a lot of tires, uh, car parts, that sort of thing. Uh, a small area of sediment excavation, the oil in the ground had migrated to the, to the brook in the 90s. Um, and had impacted an area. Uh, and then the fourth component, there were some soil piles that were brought on site. These po soil piles uh, were from other sites, mildly impacted, and the former operator was going to make those into, um, into asphalt, started doing the asphalt batching, which ultimately I think the smell and the odor um, is what triggered the neighbors to, to complain about this site. Uh, the fifth component here shown is the groundwater treatment system or management of migration. Uh, and, and then the last one is really attacking the source areas, the, those LNAPL areas. And as it was written in the rod, it was soil vapor extraction with potential thermal enhancements. So the team was working with our, you know, with our state and federal um, team. And someone suggested, what if we move the groundwater piece first and really go for attack? What, what's, let's stop off the migration of groundwater impacts off the property that are heading to these private drinking water wells. Um, any of the wells that were impacted, the state had put in point of entry treatment systems um, right away, but let's let's stop that that impact. The, the, um, the next one would be let's, once we've got the groundwater system going, why don't we, let's attack the source areas, right? Let's let's prevent any future leaching, let's, let's address the oil. Um, and so through our pre-design work, Clearly, was soil vapor extraction wasn't going to be uh, sufficient, uh, and thermal treatment of the the oil was was needed. Um, the next component, we have an area uh, we call it the lower landfill. It's it's essentially the area between the brook and where we had treated thermal that is shallow enough to excavate, and it had some of the debris. So one, we didn't want to thermally treat up to it, uh, up to the brook, uh, but also had to excavate the debris. So this is it. That's this next component, and that would be the final component that would have a um, potential impact for leachability to groundwater. And then the remaining components, taking off the soil piles, um, any of the shallow soil impacts, uh, and the remainder of the, the debris as that last piece. Um, it, really the driver was trying to cut off uh, groundwater, the spread of groundwater impacts, uh, but also um, we'll talk through it in a minute about just some of the other benefits that, that we were able to see. Uh, a lot's going on. This is a multi-remedy site. Uh, so obviously, as as we've already just 
walked through the um, the main components. It's it's high energy um, potential for a lot of truck traffic. Uh, so we did look at back one of the first things that were done was an access evaluation. The site former um, access was along a private not a private road but a, a, a narrow a residential road uh, and actually worked with the, the community to find uh, a better access point and put in a, a traffic signal to do um, any sort of transport of materials in and out of the site safer. We've got the groundwater treatment system that was installed around 2012-2013. Uh, it's 130 gallon per minute system. It treats naturally occurring iron, arsenic, and manganese via microfiltration. And um, right when we were in the midst of the design, it was the kind of the sweep of the one four dioxane um, identification, and and so we do treat one four dioxane and VOCs via advanced oxidation, and then uh, we do have carbon polishing uh, that does remove PFAS. Uh, the next phase, as we're in the midst of doing the de the design work, uh, also looking at one four dioxane further in the neighborhood. Uh, we were able to find a private water utility to, that had capacity to connect some of the houses, these residential um, private drink, drinking water wells uh, to their to their private water line. And so that was done around 2013. And we were able to take uh, remove those point of entry systems. Uh, and then we shifted into the source source area. So we've got thermal treatment of the former lagoon and the underground and above ground storage tank area. And here's a snapshot, it's an aerial from, from last week. Uh, and this is the first, this is that lower landfill excavation or, or treating between um, the two, the sheet pile area along the edge of the brook. So I, I think just to, to, to highlight the benefits of this, this remedy sequence shift. So this the circle here is that's the treatment building. Um, the property line is, is essentially the bottom of this, this photo. Uh, those seven circles are the, the extraction wells. Uh, you know, not only are we stopping the, the flow of, of water off the property, but we're also treating uh, in, in almost 500 million gallons of water um, have, been, have been treated on site. Uh, all of this is discharged back to the ground. Uh, as I mentioned, there's no sewer system. Um, so all of it, it gets treated to drinking water standards uh, and gets discharged either through an infiltration basin, which is just to the north of that circle or to a series of injection wells um, kind of on the to the east of the, the system. So these are the two areas here uh, circled in blue where the thermal was done and we implemented steam enhanced extraction. So using steam, injecting it in the ground, you pull um, your vapors, oil, water um, out. And, and once we separated the oil, we were able to uh, pre-treat and then send for final polishing to the the system and and what really is the kind of the cool kind of the, the, the great feature here is that we we're able to use the treated water from the plant for steam um, so we had a boiler on site uh, and was able to use that treated water to, to generate steam for both both systems so it was a really nice uh, you know close closed circuit loop uh, for the for the water um, reuse and, and conservation. So we conserved about 25 million gallons of water um, and avoided the transport of over 11 million gallons of water to the site to generate that steam. Um, had we had to chuck it in from someplace, uh, that step alone would have, would have um, has helped, being able to use the water on site helped reduce our greenhouse gas emissions by 65 metric tons, um, which Katie had calculated. Um, and so I know one of, the, one of our other um, surf, surf members always ask, well, what does that actually mean, right? And so putting that into a, a different um, way to look at it, the greenhouse gas equivalency calculator uh, on EPA's website um, for this particular step is just to look at it from, say, gasoline um, consumed over 7,300 gallons um, or the electricity from 11 homes for a year. Uh, I also like to look at it for, okay, if we were going to have what um, acreage of forested land would we need to sequester that? And it's over 85 acres. So, so that's a snapshot for the just the, the big parts of the remedy. Uh, we obviously there's a lot more to it, and I mean I could, we could talk for for days on this. Um, but you know we've been working on this project for for over 15 years, and through that time, you know we had the EPA 
greener cleanups come into play, the, the ASTM standards, um, and you know, obviously absorbing all that information in. Um, we also work with our client team um, and look at you know, what are some of the cost savings, cost avoidance, uh, and we quickly realized a lot of them overlapped. So a lot of our the, the greener efforts that we were doing were also um, cost savings. And so um, we've we do try to spend a little time sharing with our, our client team regularly uh, some of these. And so I'll walk through um, the, the these are the five EPA uh, core elements of their greener cleanups. This starting with water, and I'll give a few examples. There's obviously many more, uh, but uh, starting with water, we I mentioned this earlier, so we, we're using the treated water for steam generation. Uh, all of that water is being sent back to the ground to, at drinking water standards. The town does not have a water source. It's, it is ground, groundwater is its water source. It doesn't have a, a surface water. Um, and so the importance of uh, aquifer rest restoration is, is huge. And then we, we've used the treated water for a number of different things. Uh, even now, um, but over any time we're doing some construction activities, uh, dust suppression is certainly an, an easy one. Uh, energy, shifting to that, uh, we'll use solar power monitoring units uh, to not only reduce our you know, electrical usage, but, but more not having to bring in extra power, uh, whether temporary or permanent, um, to these remote locations. The, the treatment building is, is heated uh, via geothermal uh, using the extracted groundwater that we're, we're treating and when we were doing thermal operations we brought in a natural gas line natural gas isn't really prevalent in that this area of the the town um, we did find a, a, a enough of a line <laughs> like a, enough of a, of a source to be able to connect um, to this to the site for thermal operations obviously a big energy intensive uh, remedy component uh, the feasibility study had actually estimated that we would need a, a fuel tank, a fuel oil tanker truck driving to and from the site each day. Uh, air, uh, a lot of this, uh, the air obviously is reducing our, 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 our greenhouse gas impacts. Anytime we can reduce um, trips to the site, uh, the use of remote telemetry for monitoring activities. I mentioned I, the last slide. I had a picture of uh, we had some sound dust in PID monitoring locations. Uh, this particular one is a transducer, the remote telemetry, so we could look at temperature and water levels during thermal, uh, not only reducing the number of, of trips to the site, a lot less labor time, um, but it's also just much, much safer for our team. Remote access to any of our treatment systems, less trips to the site, less late night troubleshooting uh, trips. We can do that quicker and more efficiently from home. Uh, and I mentioned the, the natural gas in the previous slide, but just ultimately having less truck trips back and forth. Materials and waste, uh, I, I will pause and I want to commend the our client's construction manager. It does a phenomenal job with reusing, finding things across the site and finding new ways to, to reuse them. Uh, and so um, one of the things we, we did start with was let's use these soil piles that are on site, some, some of those that are less impacted. Uh, we needed to grade the, the first thermal area, uh, so it eliminated bringing clean fill on the site for us to just then excavate out later. Uh, this will ultimately have to go off-site, um, but let's get let's use it, have a, site, a beneficial use while we can. Uh, any sort of piping, uh, fencing, all kinds of materials that we'll reuse during subsequent uh, remedy components. And anytime we clear, uh, we will use that for habitat enhancement and. I think that's probably a good transition to the, the, the last of the core elements, um, land and ecosystems. I'm going to transition to Carrie, who will walk through this, which uh, as a remediation engineer, we, we don't, I have not had other sites that I've had the opportunity to be part of this. It's, it's a very cool, the conservation uh, aspect of it. Uh, so with that, I'm going to pass it to Carrie. Thank you. So in 2013, as part of the groundwater treatment system construction, there was this small strip of land that had to be cleared so that we can make space for the underground electrical and water lines for the reinjection of that treated groundwater down by the brook. And so as you can see in the picture above, this strip of land very much looks like a kind of fairway that you would find on a golf course. And so it forever became dubbed the fairway. 
And during restoration of the fairway, our team recognized the opportunity that we could create habitat that didn't already exist on site. And this habitat primarily consisted of a native meadow. And that was really the start of our first habitat project. That's how it got launched. Uh, became the foundation of the future conservation activities. Um, and as a result of that, we also developed a wildlife habitat vision. And our vision is to foster habitat elements that support wildlife, seek ways to integrate remediation and restoration, and communicate to internal and external stakeholders the value of ecological attributes on the site. Next slide, thank you. Uh, in addition to the native meadow that we created in the fairway, uh, we also constructed two habitat enhancing brush piles, one on either side of the fairway, and we put up three bird boxes to target cavity nesting birds. So the native meadow um, was seeded when flowering plants and it encouraged native pollinators and the brush piles that were constructed to provide habitat for these small mammals. Um, we were fortunate enough to have a local craftsman build the birdhouses and over the years we've seen them used by bluebirds, house wrens, and chickadees. So there's some pictures there. All right, so as a result of those three projects, we have received initial certification from the Wildlife Habitat Council in 2015. And from that, um, we continue to build upon those three previous projects by sharing the ongoing activities that we do through community open houses and the town's local old home day. So there's been a lot of really great conservation work that we've shared with the community over the years. Um, we've had the opportunity to show the neighbors and the town residences what the groundwater treatment system looks like. We've also shared with them a number of items that we found across the site, like mushrooms, animal fur, birds' nests. Um, and at one point, we even had the state turtle rehabilitator bring a few state endangered and threatened turtles to the site to help the kids really understand the importance of conservation. So after we received certification in 2015, um, we needed to implement a number of new projects in order to maintain that certification. So these new projects included planting a milkweed stand to encourage monarch butterfly population increases. We conducted a baseline bat count um, and the results of that were really neat because we had the opportunity to work with the local high school STEM students and they constructed bat houses for the five different species that we saw out on site. And then we were able to hang those bat houses up and they were incorporated as part of our monthly monitoring. And then finally, we also hosted the high school botany class and they conducted a number of in-field plant surveys. So because of these new projects, the Wildlife Habitat Council awarded our project a gold certification in 2017. So over time, these conservation efforts have continued to evolve through a number of other activities and projects that we've done. Um, in the bird boxes that we put in, we had some bluebird predation. And so that prompted the installation of the sparrow spookers, which were built by the local Girl Scouts. And those are the um, PVC with the silver foil that's hanging on the birdhouses. Um, we also noticed that we were starting to find a lot of invasive plants creeping into the native meadow. So we really ramped up our mowing activities and did some selective invasive plant removal. And then finally, we refurbished the brush pile to make them more appealing to small animals. So most recently, um, we've expanded our conservation efforts to areas beyond the fairway and across the rest of the site. Uh, we installed two duck boxes to target wood ducks, um, one of which actually successfully had a clutch of eggs just a couple of weeks later. So our timing was, was good with that one. Um, we've also installed game cameras throughout the site. And that gave us the opportunity to really see what we had for animals. And I was at least surprised by the diversity that existed there. Um, we saw everything from small mammals like rabbits and porcupines and woodchucks to larger animals like deer and black bear. And at one point we even had a bobcat family on site. 
So there was also a summer when we noticed that there were turtle eggs in the infiltration basins where the treated groundwater sometimes piped to for infiltration. And the sandy habitat was perfect for the snapping turtles along Kelly Brook. We were finding they were actually coming up out of the brook, uh, laying their eggs in this area. So in 2021, we started a new project that consisted of building um, these turtle nest protectors for the two snapping turtle nests that we had. And we constructed them out of wood using old pallets that we had on site and some old wire mesh. And then we set the game cameras up over these areas and we caught a lot of skunks and raccoons trying to get to the eggs. None of them were successful um, and the eggs in one of the two nests actually hatched later that summer. So I think one of the most interesting things that we've discovered over the last couple of years was that the site wasn't just a place for the animals that passed through on their way to the next spot. Uh, it really was an area that provided enough food, water, and safe, secure habitat for wildlife families. So in addition to the clutches of duck eggs that we've had, we've also seen fawns scampering around on our game cameras. There's been bobcat kittens, and we even had a family of four raccoons playing in the brook. So after seeing the diversity of wildlife on the property, uh, we really began to look into why there were so many animals here. Uh, the wildlife that were primarily seen were located along Kelly Brook and in the nearby wooded wetlands. So the brook really provides habitat, seclusion, and food for the various wildlife, but it also connects the property to some nearby conservation land, which provided this safe corridor for animal passage. The additional research that we did about those wildlife travel patterns was when we came across the Connect the Coast project report from the Nature Conservancy. And this really became our aha moment. Um, when everything kind of came together and we, we really understood what the last piece of the puzzle was in terms of conservation. So the Connect the Coast project was developed by the Nature Conservancy. Uh, and it was done so in collaboration with a large number of other private conservation groups and government agencies. The project focused on the connectivity of wildlife habitat areas throughout southern New Hampshire via these wildlife corridors, which generally followed um, brooks and small rivers in the area. The information in that report really validated our observations and confirmed our understanding of why we had so many animals on site. Kelly Brook and the site was at the junction of three major wildlife corridors. So the game camera footage wasn't just capturing animals passing through, um, it really verified that Kelly Brook and the site were an integral part of these, these three corridors and in, in, in protecting the animals that were there. And it really strengthened our belief that um, continued habitat restoration efforts were important. And so that sort of, then transitioned us into understanding, you know, how do we how do we continue this work and what do we what do we need to do to track it and understand where our next steps are. So now I'm going to transition it over to Katie, who's going to talk to us about just how sustainable our efforts on site have been. Great, thanks, Carrie. Um, yeah, so Kathy and Carrie both just went through some great examples at the site of how we've incorporated sustainability into our remedy. Um, but the question that always follows is, um, how do you measure or quantify this? Or, or how do you answer the question, how sustainable is it? Um, and this, is, this be becomes important because people want to measure their progress over time. Um, and the answer really is going to be specific to the project. So for every project, you're going to need to develop a way to measure and track your sustainability so that you can meet those project specific sustainability and ESG goals. Um, so the way that we look through this is um, kind of this three step process, um, starting at the bottom of the pyramid with inventory. Um, if you click next on this slide. Um, so what we look at, um, it's, it's really looking at an inventory of your project. So where you're at in the, the remedial process, um, what stage of that remedy you're looking at. Um, also what media you're looking at um, that's impacted. Um, really just trying to get an overall sense of what your remedial goals look like, what that timeline might look like, um, and where you're going to start incorporating sustainability in that. 
Um, once you have a sense of, of sort of the overall layout of your project, um, then you want to start identifying your sustainability goals. Um, and this really comes from a variety of drivers. So you could have regulatory requirements, um, you could have uh, company sustainability goals, um, you could also have uh, community driven goals. So for this project in particular, we mentioned earlier that's in a very residential area with a lot of community involvement. Um, and finally, cost considerations um, can often be a driver when you're defining your goals for sustainability. Um, then you move on to figuring out how you're going to plan and measure metrics against those goals. Um, and there's really two different ways to look at this. There's a more quantitative aspect um, where you might look at uh, how Kathy mentioned earlier, that conversion we found between the gallons of water saved to the uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so that, that would be an example of a more quantitative evaluation, um, or you could have a more qualitative evaluation um, where you look at things like the number of sustainable actions achieved or best management practices implemented, um, or a lot, a lot of the things that Carrie mentioned um, where you're kind of implementing sustainability, but it's maybe not in terms of, you know, tons of greenhouse gas emissions saved. So using a combination of those two, two tools is really where you can kind of customize your solution so that you can track your sustainability over time for a project. So looking at the, those three steps specifically for this project, um, sort of looking at the inventory of our site, it's a super fun site. We have a multi-party PRP client. Um, as Kathy mentioned, we have a lot of remedial components um, that are going through the sequencing of this remedy. Um, and we were really looking at the full project life cycle. Um, whereas you might have some projects where you come in and you're just looking at sustainability of your design or your implementation. Um, for this one, we really wanted to look at the entire project life cycle. Um, so then when we started looking at developing goals, um, there are a few major considerations. So one major piece of this was what Carrie covered with um, getting that wildlife habitat certification. Um, so that was a major sustainability goal for this project. Um, a second goal that Kathy mentioned um, was related to the cost savings and avoidance tracking. Um, and in particular, we wanted to show how cost savings and avoidance and sustainability often go together. Um, finally, one of our goals was to implement um, greener cleanup BMPs as defined in the ASTM standard. Um, a big driver for this was the fact that this is a super fun site regulated by EPA. So we wanted to incorporate the EPA greener cleanup guidance and those five core elements and as such turn to the ASTM guidance um, since they have the greener cleanup best management practices that fit into those core elements. Um, so then when looking at what our sort of plan and measure system was going to look like, um, we had a few requirements we wanted to meet. So one was how we were going to get team input. Um, it was going to be really important to us that whatever system we develop um, be able to be easily accessed both internally at Woodard and Curran, but also with our external project team. Um, another aspect that was very critical to us was the, the real-time feedback. Um, we wanted people to be able to sort of enter information about these sustainable actions as they occurred. Um, we definitely wanted it to be a very visual representation of our sustainability progress. Um, and that in part goes with this final bullet here of streamlining our reporting as well. So keeping those four bullets in mind, we decided to develop Power BI dashboard um, since that allowed us to not only set up a very simple system on the back end that um, could be accessed internally and externally for data entry, um, but also is very visually um, appealing as well. Um, so I'm going to talk through a few of the um, uh, landing pages from our Power BI dashboard. So this first one here is the page where we track our ASTM BMP implementation. Um, so you can see up at the top, we just track a straight number of BMPs implemented. Um, and again, this is just pulling from the backend data where we have our team members enter in information about the BMPs they've implemented. Um, so we break it down by the five core elements defined by EPA and their greener cleanups. Um, and then on the bottom left, you can also view that as a pie chart. Um, and on the bottom right, we break it down uh, separately by um, type of BMP as well, or BMP category. So you can have ones related more to buildings versus project planning versus vehicles. Um, again, just to get a sense of where we've kind of been targeting um, the implementation of our, our BMPs at the site. 
Um, so then we look at sort of our sustainable actions taken, and this has to do with sort of looking at these three pieces of sustainability. Um, if you click one forward, there we go. So um, what we look here, look at here is um, what we refer to as our, our sustainability achievements, um, but really breaking them down into those three um, pillars of sustainability, the environmental aspect, the economic aspect, and the social aspect as well. Um, so on the left, you have a simple breakdown into those three categories. Um, and on the right, again, you can look at it in terms of the greener cleanup core elements. Um, then we take a deeper dive at sort of the sustainability achievements, um, looking over the project life cycle. So this bar across the top looks at the different uh, phases of our project from site assessment through design, implementation, O&M, and optimization. Um, so again, we can kind of see where our sustainability actions, where we've managed to integrate them the most into our remediation work. Um, we also look at it in the bottom left graphic here uh, by remedial component. So um, like we mentioned, there's a few different remedies happening here. We've had a couple of phases of thermal, um, the groundwater system is running. So that allows us to look at the breakdown um, by those components by phase as well. Um, and then on the, the two right graphics here, that again breaks it down by the, the three pillars of sustainability. So again, we can kind of see, are we heavier on environmental um, sort of impacts to the environmental pillar versus the social pillar? Um, and, and can summarize that from there. Um, and finally, that goal I mentioned about our cost metrics. Um, so a, a big part of this was wanting to show that cost savings and sustainability go together. So this, these two graphics um, from our dashboard allow us to look at the cost savings over time. Um, so when you look at the, the left graphic, that's just our pure cost savings and cost avoidance. Um, whereas on the right, we look at the cost savings items that are also considered sustainable. So that way we can get a sense of the correlation that we see between cost savings and sustainability. So this project, um, really, I think the takeaway here is that we have um, remediation and wildlife habitat enhancements and community outreach all working together. Um, really, the client's dedication to this kind of sustainable remediation approach um, ultimately enhanced the site's cleanup strategy, as, as Kathy talked about at the beginning, um, but also gave us opportunities to sort of protect and establish the wildlife habitat, um, as Carrie discussed. Um, using these green remediation strategies. Um, and, and on top of that, you get these conservation projects that allowed us to engage the community stakeholders in the process as well, um, really making them a key part of the success of this remediation to date. So with that, I think we can open it up to questions. Yeah, thank you, Katie. <clears throat> um, just a reminder to everybody on, if you have questions, please go ahead and enter them into the questions box and we'll work through those. But we have a few in so far, we'll get going. Um, uh, yeah, first one here, uh, prior to the construction of the groundwater treatment system, um, had you seen wildlife on site and, and realized the extent of what was out there or what could be out there? I can start this and maybe Carrie you should jump, but um, you know, my first time out on site, uh, we saw deer out there, right? So this was 15 years ago, walking the first initial um, site walk. You know, the, the property hadn't been used or seen by people or, you know, in a while. Um, and so certainly I've seen a lot of smaller critters moving around. Um, and, and over time, we actually had a, had a whiteboard in the plant uh, where, where staff could could add a list of, of different animals um, that we've seen. Uh, the, my opinion, personally, from you know what we see for the game cameras, I had you know no idea that some of the you know, bobcat families and just the you know, the, the raccoons, coyotes, uh, the, you know, the fact that we got the black bear out there that that was was pretty neat. I don't know if Carrie you want to add to to that. I think I would just add that you know for this being a super fun site. You think of them as dirty and unappealing and contaminated. And you know, while it is contaminated, it still was this, there was a piece of it that just had so much vibrancy and diversity of wildlife on it. And that was the part that really surprised me the most because I just wasn't expecting to see all of that on a hazardous waste site. 
Um, uh, next one was uh, related to the community outreach program um, and how, how you got that started. It seems just my opinion that it seems like it's been highly successful and, and, and attended and yeah. info on how to maybe get that going at some at other sites. Yeah, I mean, I think I, I, it really comes down to our, our, our client group is just super uh, um, having no, they basically wanted to be out there making sure we're interacting with our our neighbors. Uh, like we said, they're, they're, they're people's private, their homes right right there. Uh, so anytime we were doing any sort of uh, dis uh, investigation or starting a new construction work, we go door to door with flyers, right? So whether we leave them there, we get a chance to talk to them. We also, uh, client lead had started a Facebook page and uh, extremely successful in just getting all the information out there, photos on progress. Uh, right now, we've got a ton of photos up there from the excavation that's going on uh, this, this summer and fall. Um, and the community loves to be able to, to see that. Um, and so I think kind of those two things, just that door to door. Uh, and then once we started going through this wild, the, the conservation aspect, people just want to come see. They want to they want to see what's behind the fence. Yeah. No. Um, so can you discuss a little bit more just about the effects of having multiple um, responsible parties and, and establishing, um, I would say, both those sustainability goals, but also that. Uh, any challenges or hurdles that may have had or were benefits related to the community outreach program as well? Well, I think they all, I mean, going back to that community outreach, I think that the, all the transparency with, with the neighbors was just always from, from day one. Um, so that makes it really, um, really easy. There wasn't that, that hesitation. Uh, as far as uh, the group, uh, Sure, there may be some that were more vocal initially, say to say, let's let's go do this. Um, and then once you see the benefits of of having all that, whether it's community outreach um, or the conservation work, it, it the rest follows suit with no issue. Did it, did having those multiple responsible parties have kind of any change in direction of some of the sustainability goals, um, or was that led more by the project? Uh, execution team well one of them like you know specifically the wildlife habitat council work was was one specific uh group member who uh was really passionate about it and um really sold you know all of us the, the, whether the the rest of the, the responsible parties or, or us our client yeah, team uh, and so i think it just really takes somebody who's enthusiastic and uh able to engage the, the rest of the team um, to get something pushed forward. As far as, uh, you know, conflicts or anything with sustainability goals, uh, no, I, mean, I don't think so. I think we're we tried to keep it uh, simple, right? So nothing uh, too crazy, but we will do greenhouse gas uh, calculations um, when we see that it, it, it's a beneficial um, to be able to, to show what was uh, a positive going on. Um, we, we I think it just depends on what the specific task is as well. I don't know if Katie or Carrie have anything else to add. No, that, that was a pretty good summary. Um, with all the community outreach and the programs, uh, having folks on site, did you were there any unique challenges being a super fun site as far as you know having having people on site and doing plant counts or um, anything like that? Yeah, normally, certainly we would want to have some restrictions, uh, but one of the, when we were doing the design of the groundwater treatment system, we actually, and putting in the new access route, uh, specifically created a clean corridor so that uh, the driveway, um, we could actually get, uh, you know, anyone, UPS, FedEx, uh, anyone can get down there without being on the, the impacted side. Uh, and that also was beneficial when we're constructing the plant uh, because you didn't have to have at least initially, those some of the the workers uh, on site didn't all have to be 40-hour Hazwopper trained. Um, you know, obviously, once um, the plant the plants are operating, anyone in there would. But the the, the ability to have this, this corridor that's clean, and then around the plant, um, the the soil is is not impacted, and, and anywhere in that wildlife corridor is 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 an undisturbed clean area, so to speak. Um, so there really is no no risk for that. 
So it's, you know, it's unique for sure, uh, but I think it's it's worked out really well to be able to to bring people in. Um, yeah, I think we're. Let's see if we get any more here shortly. Um, we're not seeing um, any more questions coming in. Um, is there? I guess, is there anything? You know, what was? I just kind of, you know, what was your favorite part of this kind of project? I, to me, the wildlife is a is a pretty unique aspect to really be able to to dig into it like you guys had. Um, but uh, yeah, Gary, I think for me the the part that I've enjoyed the most is that so many of my other projects are focused on just the phase that they're in right now, whether it's investigation or remediation. Um, but the neat thing about this project is that the client team is very forward thinking. And so, you know, we're implementing this conservation work and this restoration work wherever we can, which I think really speaks to the fact that you can do site cleanup and restoration at the same time. Um, and I really appreciate the opportunity that the client team has provided us to be able to see that through because so many of our other projects don't start thinking about restoration work until all of the remediation is done. And oftentimes it can be too late by then. I think another part in addition to the, the conservation, but just the just the community outreach. Again, that's just a very, um, it's not often the case for a lot of our sites, um, but being able to have people come to the site, we've done bat counts, um, you know, and uh, just being able to share the work we do with the community. I mean, that's a, a rare treat to be able to do that. Yeah, I, I agree. I think the community outreach on this project um, is, uh, unique, um, but I I wish it wasn't unique. I think it's a great example of something that we should do more of on all of our projects because um, I think it um, ultimately I think it's it's keeping this site on a very forward looking track for what are what is it ultimately going to be? Um, what does the community want it to be? Um, and I think that um, keeping them involved in it has been a really positive experience for everybody. Yeah, no, I, I can see that. Um, well, yeah, I guess uh, if there's no more questions, I'll uh, go ahead and turn it over, turn it back over to Kyle here, uh, to give a few closing remarks related to SURF and some upcoming stuff we have going on. Yeah, thank you. Um, I thank you everybody for your time today. Thank you, Kathy, Carrie, and Katie for a great presentation. I think it was very informative and much appreciated. So um, with that, just a few other highlights. So opportunities to get involved in SURF. Um, let's see, SURF members, if you'd like to contribute to a editorial column in the Remediation Journal, we're always looking for members who who, who have an idea or would be willing to do something like this. So please reach out. If you're a member or part of a sponsor company and have an idea for a topic for a webinar and would like to use the SURF platform, um, we'd be happy to host you. So uh, please feel free to reach out on that. And lastly, regarding technical initiatives, a new one on environmental justice is getting started. You know, always looking for people who are interested in either that or another idea. So. Um, Finally, on the last slide, just say uh, you can find us uh, on our YouTube channel, uh, find this webinar or past webinars. And again, those how to see the SiteWise videos are there. Um, let's see. And then find SURF, if you're attending AHS, SURF will be having a booth and hosting some various sessions. So come by, say hi. Uh, we'll also have an open meeting that's open to either members or non-members. And one of our other sponsors, Langen, is gonna host a SURF happy hour. So look for emails regarding that info. 
And just as always, a big thank you to our sponsors. We need them to be able to do things like this. And always a special thank you to Trihydro. They do much of the behind the work scenes and setting up and hosting these webinars. So with that, I look forward to seeing you all at the next presentation or at AEHS. Thank you.